Greetings all. Okay, the next Q&A, number 17. Firstly, as usual, I'm gonna go back to a couple of issues from the previous Q&A, and I'm gonna kick off with the depleted uranium discussion. Yes, I am aware that there is a concern of the lingering effects of DU in the environment, particularly as regards the water table. This stuff is, after all, a heavy metal. However, it does seem that a lot of folks are not familiar with the recent research into the negative effects of tungsten, which isn't as benign as originally thought. Uh, put it this way, you don't want much military grade tungsten alloy in the water table either. And it does have to be the tungsten alloy, not just pure tungsten. And this is research that's maybe in the last 10 or 15 years. So the idea that you are not poisoning the world by not using DU doesn't really hold water. Also, Steve Zaloga sent me a copy of his article from many moons ago in Military Modeling Magazine about the Chinese use of tanks, addressing another question which I had no answer to at the time. Apparently, they kicked off with armored trains following Soviet practice with Soviet advisors. The first tanks they got were 36 FTs, uh, agricultural tractors, sorry, in about 1925. China at the time was a rather fractured state with various warlords causing annoyance with each other. Chiang Kai-shek sent the Russians packing in 1927 and they got German advisors in instead. A number of the FTs saw service against the Japanese in Manchuria in 1931. Two dozen Carton Lloyds started arriving for the Nanking government in 1929. An up armament program started in 1935 with Japan as a likely opponent, and the Germans sold them the 10 Panzer Ones that everybody knows about, a couple of dozen SDKFZ 221 and 222s. The Italians sold them 20 CV 33s, suckers. Uh, 20 Vickers six-tonners showed up in 29 amphibious tanks model 1931. The British tanks went to Shanghai, the German and Italian vehicles seem to have been sent to Nanking. Most of the British tanks did not survive the Battle for Shanghai 1937. Given that the Japanese objected to the Germans helping the Chinese, I'm kind of, what sort of friends are you Germans helping the people we're fighting? The German advisors were sent away and the Russians were invited back. They brought with them four score and seven T26 model 1933s. However, with the stabilizing of the Russian Eastern Front after Kalkingol, the Soviets lost interest in China. There didn't seem to be any point in spending any effort. So the US stepped in next, providing M3 scout cars and later British stocks of Lend-Lease M4A4 Shermans, M3A3 Stuarts, and a few lighter armored vehicles, which were knocking around in India. These fought in the Burma area before going on to fight in the Civil War. So a thanks to Steve for that one. A couple of Greeks have chimed in on the use of the ex-German BMPs. It seems that they didn't like them very much, didn't try to maintain the weapon systems or buy ammo, and turned them into APCs for a while. Then they took the turrets off, plonked a ZU-23-2 on top, and now use them primarily on the islands to defend against aircraft and landing craft. So apparently, as I say, they didn't like them, and one person said they're trying to get Bradleys. Well, I guess, I mean, if Lebanon has them now, apparently we gave them to Lebanon. I don't see why the Greeks can't get them. I don't know how they can afford them, but I don't see why they can't get them. Anyway, on with the questions, and starting with Charles Charange. Was Archer successful? If it was, why weren't there more rear-facing TDs? If it wasn't, why were so many made and used into the 60s? As an interim vehicle, I guess it would have to qualify as successful. User opinion seemed to vary, bearing in mind that it's basically a direct competitor to the M10. And yes, it was used after the war by the Royal Armoured Corps and the Divisional RAC regiments for a few years, and then of course it was in service with other nations. The positives were that the fighting compartment was very roomy, which is quite handy when you are slinging very large rounds around, and that the overall silhouette was small, making the vehicle easy to conceal. The negative is that if you have a concealed facing a direction that the enemy decides not to use, then you lose your concealment if you turn it to engage, a problem that the M10 did not have. Interestingly, though it would be logical to presume that the fact that the vehicle is facing a way to make escape easy would be a good thing, I have not actually come across any user accounts saying how great this was. 
That said, I've only encountered a small amount of opinions on the thing overall, because I don't hang out the British archives all that much. I have a suspicion, though, that the only reason why Archer hung around as long as it did wasn't that it was a particularly great vehicle, as much that it just mounted a 17-pounder, which wasn't a bad gun, and they simply hadn't produced enough Centurions yet. Matthew Lesich. Soviet consumer goods had a reputation for being of poor quality. Did Soviet tanks suffer from this problem, and if so, did this reduce their combat effectiveness? I wouldn't say so. There's a difference between something being technologically inferior or crude, and uh, between that and being of poor quality. Compared to the rest of the world's products, yes, Soviet tanks were often a half step behind, most specifically in terms of night fighting. So, for example, the T-80 was still using active infrared when other tanks around the Western world had moved to image intensifiers or thermal imagers, and fire control systems were weaker as well. That does not, however, mean that they didn't work to specification. So I view it a little bit like ladder jokes. The whole premise of a ladder joke is that they are terrible cars. However, terrible or not, you do still see them chugging around in Russian winters. If they truly were such awful vehicles, would they still be rolling around doing their jobs? Compare with a more or less contemporary vehicle, let's say uh, that actually got reasonable reviews at the time, the Lancia Beta. How many of those are still rolling, despite being supposedly better than Lada's? So, sure, new models occasionally would have teething difficulties, but when they were sorted out, the tanks were not known for rusting apart, having springs go flying off at random intervals, losing road wheels, or otherwise being of poor quality. They simply were not necessarily as capable and refined as their opposition. Admiral Tiberius. It seems like the French tank helmet was popular with American tankers towards the end of the war. Was this a personal choice by individual tankers, or did units adopt it wholesale? Well, if you think about it, it would be a little bit odd for Americans to be finding randomly scattered around the countryside French tank helmets which happened to be compatible with American intercom systems. Best as I can determine, a production order was placed with French industry in late 1944 for a modified version of the French tank helmet, and this was done for two reasons. Firstly, it was part of a program to restart the French economy. Secondly, it also reduced shipping requirements that they needed to get stuff to France. So if you, know, you lost or damaged your helmet, you just get one locally. So as a result, the pre-war French tank helmet design was modified a little bit to accommodate the helmet liner with the integrated earphones. Now, whether or not these were genuinely preferred to the American design or not, I can't tell you. Hammer of Terror. How is it that the tanks in Girls and Panzers get thrown around so much without a track being thrown, despite there being a lack of any evidence that the girls perform any track tensioning? Well, it's a cartoon. And in fairness, at the end of uh, episode, season one, if I recall, the Panzer IV does lose the track, side, sc uh, side scraping around the back or side skidding around the, the, the side of a German vehicle. How long can an MBT be kept running in combat conditions if you don't perform that maintenance regularly? Good question. I have never attempted to skip track maintenance in order to find out the answer, and I suspect few other tank crews have either. After all, it is far easier to tension a track every day than it is to fix a thrown track once a week. The chances of throwing a track, though, aren't purely affected by simply how long ago it was that it was last tensioned, or how stretched the links are. Driver technique and the terrain type both have a lot to do with it. A good driver will, for example, identify the popping sound of a track about to be thrown far more quickly than a poor driver will, and he may be able to correct the problem before it becomes an immobilizing issue. He will also be more likely to use better driving technique to begin with, such as cutting a corner into angles instead of doing a steady curve, and this gives the spoils of dirt time to fall off the track before it accumulates too much and then walks it off. And of course the nature of the ground and the resistance that it provides to the sliding of the track as it turns, or the creation of that amount of spoil will also have an effect. 
So in other words, proper track tension reduces the likelihood of a problem, but does not categorically prevent it, and neither will skipping it for a while guarantee that you will have a problem. So your answer to the question is, it depends, but nobody has been masochistic enough to want to find out by way of a scientific assessment. George Paramore, have I ever come across an M231 firing port weapon? And if you don't know what that is, think it looks a little bit like an M16 without the stock area, without the front sight, and it's designed to plug into firing ports in the Bradley. There were originally six of them, two on each side and two on the back ramp. I have not seen any. Uh, for starters, my Bradleys were M3s, which never had the firing ports in a hole to begin with, although again, it does have the ones in the rear ramp, so there wasn't a great need for them. And besides, cavalry Bradleys, the M3s, weren't really envisioned to be wading through the thick of the battlefield with machine guns blazing on all sides. I am told, though, that they do remain in the inventory, for whatever reason. Are there any documented cases of a shot going down the barrel? I straight down the barrel of an enemy tank. Now, I don't have it to hand, but I do seem to recall an incident described by Dimitri Loza of a tank where a loader was hit by a bullet when he was down inside the tank with the hatches closed. And that the conclusion was that the tank was being strafed by a German aircraft around, entered the gun tube, ricocheted its way down the barrel, came out the open breach and into the loader. There have certainly been instances where a round has gone perpendicularly through the cannon of another tank, and indeed I do seem to recall reference to it being a deliberate tactic in the cases of meeting a heavy enemy tank that you may not ordinarily be able to kill. So you may not be able to punch through the armor, but if you hit the gun, the tank's not a threat anymore. But as far as a main gun shot down the length of the barrel, I am unaware of any such case. Alexander H, for gun of the month, what is my everyday carry gun? That will be this one. It is a 235 SAS. And uh, the SAS, I'm happy to say, does not mean special, uh, special air service. It's SIG anti-snag. And what it is, is that in order to reduce the chances of any part of the gun snagging as you draw it from under your clothes or under your coat or wherever it is that you happen to have it, there is nothing on the outside that it can snag on. So even the corners are rounded. Uh, that means also that the slide stop is now integrated or recessed into the frame, which also means that should you reload, and I don't carry spare reloads around with me because there's only so much room inside my waist. Um, you can't use the slide stop, which is a method that I normally use. You've got to slingshot. It's the only way you're going to be able to uh, send a uh, chamber the next round. It also means that the takedown lever is no longer a lever. You know, it's now a slot. You need a screwdriver or a coin to uh, t uh, take it apart. There is no front sight post. So that can be a good thing or a bad thing. So the good thing, of course, is that, again, there's nothing to snag upon. And it also means that they put compensators, uh, and this is a small, snappy uh, pistol. Uh, so the compensators really do help keep, uh, keep the gun down as you're shooting it. But for reflex shooting at close, close range, which is all this is designed for, I mean, you're hitting basically minute of man at 10 paces. Um, ordinarily, what you do is you bring the gun up, and you only bother with the front side post. You don't bother trying to align it with the rear, with the rear side blade uh, notch. Uh, because between the muscle memory, putting the front side post on target, you're probably going to get close enough. All you're trying to do is hit the guy. You're not, you know, no, no snazzy precision shooting here. Instead of your traditional blade sights, what you have here is a, um, I don't even know what the, what the sight is called. This is a, an outer circle with an inner dot, and the inner dot represents the front sight. And unfortunately, because of the way this is designed, when you bring the gun up, the first thing you're going to see is the ring for the rear sight before you'll see the dot of the foresight. Uh, now, again, for, for what this is, a, a sort of last-ditch close defense thing, Muscle memory alone, I'm finding, is getting rounds on target. So, does the site work? Yes, it does. Do I use it? No. 
<laughs> it's about the size of it. Internal strikers, so there's no hammer to get caught on anything. And for a nine millimeter, this carries 12 rounds. Uh, I've got the extended magazine because I have big hands and it works fine. Now that said, I, I have a suspicion what I will do is I probably will move to the XL, the piece of 365 XL, which is a little bit bigger, has the sights and so on. I'm not convinced that I need the anti-snag. It's because I, I wear a proper holster and uh, it's not something that I should catch on anything. Uh, so I don't know, maybe I'll give this to the wife to put in the purse or something. We'll see. But uh, yes, this is the third SIG uh, that you will have seen here. As I say, I do like them. Uh, fun little gun to shoot. And as I say, very handy. Doesn't get in your way as you walk around. Ian Barlow, what's the advantage of return rollers and why do some vehicles not have them? The most obvious advantage to a return roller is it stops the returning track from catching on other parts of the tank and locking up the system. So for example, bogies or side skirt support arms. And that does happen. So I was driving along, idle wheel falls off, track obviously collapses straight down. And because there are skirt support arms in EM1, it brings, it locks the track, brings that side to a screeching halt. And yeah, that was the end of that mission. Uh, and it was also a, a pants changing event because that happened in Iraq and loud noises in the tank doing strange things when you're on a mission in Iraq is a little bit disconcerting. Now, another reason is that as a vehicle is traveling and the tank is bouncing up and down, well, that's a fair amount of what is in effect an unsprung mass. So let's say the tank rocks up on an obstacle and the full mass of the return run of the track, which is suspended, just on two points, the idler and the sprocket, or vice versa if you're a front engine vehicle. And this is of course presuming that the road wheel being forced up to cause the bounce in the first place isn't slamming into the track and firing that up. Then at the other end, there is a question of whether the track return has enough slack and momentum once it is on the way up and the tank is now on the way down, is the track gonna slap up and hit against the bottom of the sponsor, which you don't want it to do, track slap. Now, on the other hand, of course, there is a little bit more rolling resistance to a rollered track, and there is a little bit less of a self-tensioning effect. So if you have an unsupported track, all that weight of the track itself, that quarter ton or a third of a ton, whatever it is, is going to keep some tension on the system overall. Now, there may be some other advantages and disadvantages, but those are you know, some of the main ones. John Rayberger, what are the gut feel factors you care about when evaluating the combat effectiveness of various tank units when I first see them? Example factors are unit interaction, equipment type, historical performance, and so on. And I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that question because other than the crews under my command when I was a CEO, I never needed to go evaluate anyone else. I would think the difficult bit is making decisions quickly on the fly and in a coordinated manner. And the reason I got a job as a tank platoon leader in Iraq was that my predecessor apparently couldn't make decisions and was fired. And you know, the CO just finds me in the battalion headquarters. Further, modern combat is incredibly lethal incredibly quickly. So there's not very much time that you have to hang around to make that decision. So when you figure out your decision and you quickly get the rest of your unit on board with whatever you're doing, that's you know, half the battle. If things are correctly drilled, such as let's say target allocation, so no time is wasted, then that's even better. The actual mechanism of sending rounds down range onto a target compared to the, the tactical decision-making, very simple, and it's a lot easier to train. So your real differentiator is only gonna get sorted out during field exercises or in mass simulators like CCTT or maybe Steel Beasts if you're an Aussie, for example. Christopher Elier, how does one scuttle a tank? Although Sim Crawford's answer of open the drain holes in the hull floor is correct, it is also unnecessary in the case of most tanks. Normally, simply driving into a deep enough body of water is going to do the job. If you do wish to abandon the tank and destroy it, despite there not being a lake nearby, your next best bet is going to be a thermite grenade. Now, yeah. 
Basically, okay, you're going to abandon tank. First thing you're supposed to do is zero out, i.e. it's basically a factory reset, the radios and battlefield management system. And that is a knob on the front or a button or whatever it is, presuming that there's the power to zero it. Failing that, pull the radios out, stomp them, shoot them, whatever. You pull out the firing pin from the breech block, so that doesn't take much time to slow the breech block a little bit, it comes loose, pull it out. Pull out the machine guns. If you have a ground mount kit, fine, fit that. And then you have the thermite grenades. And what you do is you place one on top of the breech, place one on top of the engine. And these are shaped, shall we say, so that the thermite goes down. And it'll melt through the metal of the gun and of the engine. And the idea is that you place the charges on the same place on every tank that you scuttle. And that should reduce the possibility of the enemy cannibalizing the tanks, you know, take a piece here, a piece there to make a single operational one. Of course, in real life of late, the most common technique seems to be simply to shoot at it with another tank. So it's much like scuttling a ship, can be done with charges and opening the seacocks. Historically, they've just brought another ship alongside with torpedoes. So go up to your target tank, put a few rounds into it, and that should make a mess. Although perhaps a little bit less reliably so than a properly placed thermite charge. Van Owen asks about the use of captured vehicles. So you get the Beuter Panzers in German service. Who else got in on this? Well, of course, the various German allies also made use of captured vehicles for much the same reason that the Germans did. Anything is better than nothing when domestic supply cannot meet requirements. The Soviets, of course, had a very definite reuse program, such as the Su-76I, which is based on the Panzer III chassis. About 200 of them were built. Being the most commonly produced German chassis, I would presume the spare parts weren't all that hard to find. The Aussies, of course, used captured Italian armor in North Africa. There's painted big white kangaroos on the side. Again, it was a case of that or nothing at all, because the Australian armored force had basically shut down in the interwar period. It was much more rare in Western Europe for the Allies to do this for two reasons. Firstly, the Western Allies had plenty of supply and were not in such desperate need of vehicles that they would use captured ones to begin with. And secondly, even if you paint big white stars on the side, it's not necessarily going to stop Allied units from shooting at them, especially if they're flying Allied units. So as a result, instances are limited. There is the famous case of Cuckoo the Panther, that the British used for a few months. There were a couple of Stumgeschutz apparently used by US forces near Aachen, uh, but that was about the size of it. If you think about all the problems which come along with adding a foreign vehicle type to your logistical and training trains, even before you get to the problem of allies shooting at you because you're in a panzer, you realize that the detriments, the downsides to this very quickly start to outweigh any benefits. Also, he notes that both Germans and Americans were very well known for retrieving disabled vehicles. The Germans, because the things were rare and expensive, and the Americans, because they, they were easy to repair. How did other nations fare? While the British did use American M31 recovery vehicles, they also made a number of their own chassis, such as about three score of Cromwell ARVs, a number of Churchill ARVs, and a few other ones as well. The Soviets in World War II didn't really have a purpose-built ARV, but what they did do is they took a number of T-34s and they simply removed the turrets. Sometimes it was a more serious conversion, other times they simply put a tarp on top of where the turret ring was. And these would be used if nothing else as towing vehicles. And oftentimes vehicles were selected because the turrets were old or the vehicle was damaged. I have seen nothing indicating that any nation would take a disposable approach to armored vehicles. So like, okay disposable item if you lose it so be it. Pretty much if any country felt that they could recover it, they did. The only question was then how good a tank retriever you had, especially if the tank had gotten stuck in some horrible spot where you really needed an A-frame or some such like that to get it out. Even though specific purpose-built ARVs may not have been created in any numbers by let's say the Japanese or the Italians, they still had a fair bit of engineering equipment which could perform a lot of the same roles. And of course, lighter vehicles, such as Japanese or Italians, could be recovered either by other tanks or by heavy trucks and the like. Caleb Engelhart. Of all the prototype and limited production US heavy tanks, which ones uh, had the most potential and which were complete wastes of time and money? Well, I've said in the past that T-32 is a fairly reasonable one with a lot of potential. The test reports coming out of it were generally positive. 
A waste of time and money though is a little bit difficult because you can learn just about as much from your failures as you can from your successes, if not more. So I would guess the closest thing you're going to get is the M6 Heavy because they had already learned what they needed to learn and then built to score the things and officially put them into service. Even the PR campaign that they did would probably have been just happily done with only a company's worth of tanks. Grim, why did they add a cupola on top of T-48? Original vehicles didn't have one. Well, not just T-48, M-48 didn't have one either. Well, okay, technically it was a cupola. It just wasn't a cupola with the Under Armour machine gun. Uh, the original T-48 M-48 cupola had an externally mounted machine gun that could still be fired from Under Armour, much like the M-1A-1. The cupola you're thinking of showed up in the M48A1. Uh, this M1 cupola, made by the American Armaments Corporation, had two improvements over the original Chrysler design. The first was that the Chrysler design only had four periscopes, although they were actually pretty big ones. The M1 had six, counting the one that was the gun sight. The other was that in order to service the caliber 50 on the original cupola, the TC needs to open up the hatch and get out into the open, exposing him to return fire and doubtless any radiation or nuclear hazards. The next step was to fit a vision block ring with nine large periscopes pretty much contiguous all the way around that kind of fit in between the, the turret roof and the cupola itself. This vastly improved vision, interior space for the TC and made the tank even taller. So that was basically the high point of American cupola design. After that things started getting smaller again. I keep watching the, the Tank Museum's uh, videos and uh, listening to Cutland uh, talk about the, the tanks of what he's saying, Cupola, the British pronunciation. I see Cupola, I think it's right. Anyway, after they went to the M48A3 with the vision ring block, things started getting smaller again. At least until you start looking at the commander's remote weapon system that they started putting on M1A2s a couple of years ago, which are absolutely huge. There is, there is a lower profile one now that is entering service. It's still pretty big. Also, what do I think about North Korea's new tank? And people keep referring to it as a North Korean Armata, which makes absolutely no sense to me. Uh, for starters, Armata is a family of vehicles, and secondly, the tank version is an unmanned turret, and the North Korean thing is a conventionally designed tank. I mean, sure, the logo painted on the side is fairly similar, and both have seven road wheels per side, like an M1. Uh, but the tanks, you know, not even the same color. Why do they paint a desert color anyway? Uh, and frankly, if you're going to say it looks like anything, it looks like an M1. So honestly, the tank looks like an improvement on a traditional North Korean tank, down to the, the driver's vision blocks. And uh, it just has a box superstructure, it seems, welded on the outside. I'm sure better analysts than me are going to look into it, but so far I've seen nothing of any great note one way or the other about the thing, except that I am skeptical that it's as good as people might like to think it is. I mean, okay, yes, it seems to have laser warning receivers, crosswind sensor, active countermeasures, CITV, no active infrared sight, implying the possibility of thermals, a muzzle reference sensor. The gun looks a bit odd. There seems to be the old fashioned laser rangefinder box on top of the gun externally mounted. And I can't help but notice that none of the main optics are showing is they haven't opened them up. So who knows what's inside those boxes. So until more information comes out, I'm going to presume that these are pre-production mock-ups or else just nowhere near as capable as the North Koreans would like to imply that they are. So for mods, what is my biggest pet peeve when it comes to this sort of work on the internet? The first is the way that you can't upload replacement videos to YouTube, but keep the same URL and comment strings. So, for example, if you go watch the Myths of American Armor video on a PC, you will see that I uploaded a few pop-up comments and corrections. If you're watching on mobile, they won't show. And even on a PC, that option is no longer possible. It wouldn't be nice to upload an edited version of something to update. Hey, there's, there's new information has come along or correction to this. And so it doesn't happen. At least not for YouTube. The second peeve is when primary source information is readily available on the internet and people couldn't be arsed to look it up. So let's say the field manuals or technical manuals when they're available online. The third, you can doubtless guess, is when people are unable to separate objective assessment from subjective assessment, such as the subjective 
I was afraid of dying in my Sherman, which was doubtless very true. I had some concerns about dying in my M1. But the objective assessment that death was unlikely in both cases is actually the ruling one. The related concept is taking things out of context, like looking at a tank's statistics in isolation of even the question of how it fits into a combined arms force, let alone a matter of, say, logistics. I call it the top trumps effect, and David Williams had, had called it something similar. Finally, and you may have copped this from the North Korea answer I just gave, it's people having a definite opinion on something which they have never seen. So people opining about how bad Armata is or how fantastic the K2 is, that sort of thing. I mean, okay, we can come up with a few hard statistics by estimation, but it's entirely different to the idea of how the equipment fits into a combined arms battle. How well can the crew coordinate with allies, the communication systems? How effectively can they put steel on target? How user-friendly the battlefield management system interface is? How many hours a day are needed by the crew just to keep it running? So we can assume that the designers of any tank aren't idiots and that a truly bad design, defined as not meeting the design requirements, whatever they are, and not as being worse than reference tank X, is unlikely to make it past testing and into production. What are these design requirements? Who knows? But you gotta, that's what you gotta judge the tank off of. Whatever my liking for Challenger 2 as a design and its track tensioning system, I am absolutely not a fan of the gunner's control handle. Now, I can see some good points to it, such as the controls on the handle itself, or it being fixed in place for stability. But after a half hour in the, of, uh, in the simulator of the thing in Warminster, I was done. I, I couldn't do it anymore. So the next time you go on to an internet argument about best modern tank, see how often something like the gunner's control handle is mentioned. Because after all, the purpose of the tank is to put rounds on target. And the gunner's control handle is a mechanism for doing that. It's a pretty damn important part of the tank. But you won't understand the ergonomics until you've actually utilized this thing. And who talks about which has the better gunner's control handle? The Abrams, the Leopard, the T90? Nobody does. Now, okay, I'm sure some Challenger 2 crewman is going to chime in now and say that the gunner's control handle is fine and he can hit anything on a move at three kilometers first time whatever. It's not the point. It's a subjective assessment. And maybe it's just a matter of what I'm used to. I mean, hold, holding that finger, the, the activating button in, that just murdered me. So, I mean, another example might be bullpup versus conventional rifle. People who've used bullpups all their lives have no problem with, with a bullpup. And people complaining about conventional rifles saying bullpup is hard to use. The bullpup guys are going, what are you talking about? Saying that one tank is better than another is a subjective assessment. And it can relate to it. So is an Abrams better than a T-34 from World War II? Normally, yes. Now, imagine that you were a small militia group in a central African jungle and you're trying to keep your tank running. Is the Abrams still a better tank for you than the T-34? Even if both tanks are offered to you for free, but you are still responsible for maintenance and upkeep, which one are you going to pick? So these X versus Y questions are invariably argued absent both any larger context as well as some of the most important factors which determines a tank's capabilities. Anyway, rant over. On to the next question. Sim Crawford, given Russia's recent penchant for announcing new advances with no evidence, if you were in charge of Russian armor, what random new tank would I pull out of my arse just something built on existing gear. Technically possible, but absolutely the kind of thing that you doodle on the back of an envelope to hand to the engineers who will promptly bang their head on the desk hoping it'll just go away. Well, obviously we're going to have ludicrously high speeds, you know, 60 kilometers an hour, easy, with a fuel consumption rate of better than a mile to the gallon. Uh, with a lightweight composite plastic armor combined with an active defense system capable of defending against the latest missiles and kinetic energy rounds. Multiple thermal imaging systems to provide 360 degree vision with automated drones providing additional vision points for the crew. Automated track tension system which continually adjusts to the terrain. Tracks which could be either rubber block for road use or extend metal grousers uh, automatically for soft terrain. Put a vertical launch system in the extended bustle to fire either anti-tank, anti-aircraft or anti-ship missiles. Uh, actually a VL Hellfire system would actually meet that requirement should patent that idea maybe if it's not already done. 
A silent target handoff capability where one tank can control the fire of the other tanks in its platoon, thus no need for multiple lasing sources. Also possible to do missile handoffs when fired by one tank, the other tank will guide it. A battlefield management system which actively prohibits friendly fire, including against dismounted infantry. Communications include through site video transmission for the sharing of information, stealth coating making the, uh, the vehicle invisible to thermal imagers and radar, responds to the name Nike. Now almost all of these technologies are technically possible or in some cases actually in use, but whether they can work together seamlessly in an integrated package without overworking the crew or making the tank inefficiently expensive and heavy and big is something else entirely. Now, I'm sure I've missed some low-hanging pipe dreams, but you get the idea. Hugo Yu, I've noticed that a lot of British tanks have mirrors on the fenders or hull, presumably for the driver. Why isn't this a more universal design choice? Well, not really unique to the British. I mean, let's look around. Okay, so the Swedish tank, Arietta has it, the Germans have it, uh, Chinese don't seem to have it, the uh, Surio, the Brazilian one has it, the K, uh, Korean K1 has it. They are very common. Uh, you also see that some tanks come with indicators. So I'm about to make a right turn. The indicators flash. Overall, though, I would say that they are not entirely necessary because the TC up top can see pretty well and drive uh, guide the driver. Mirrors are better than nothing for the driver, but really, why bother? In the field, they are usually lowered anyway to prevent them getting broken off in the brush or getting in the way of the optics or coaxial machine guns. Loch Ness Hamster. The Canadians lost every one of their Churchill tanks at Dieppe. What was the role that these tanks were supposed to play and how did the British plan on recovering them? Well, the purpose was, as you might expect, to bring overwhelming protective firepower to support the infantry in their goals. Of course, famously, a whole bunch of them never made it off the beach. They were delivered in LCTs, three tanks to each LCT. Now, of course, getting 120 tons of tanks off an LCT is easier than getting them back on again. So when the tank goes onto the ship, if the ship is already empty and beached, you now have 120 tons of weight forcing the hull down into the sand. So presumably you could use a sand anchor to drag the LCT back off again for you know, whatever ease that would be. But the official history of the Canadian Army indicates that the LCTs were to be used to bring back the troops which had been landed, leading to the follow-on conclusion that the tanks were always intended to be abandoned in place. Of course, the vulnerability of the LCTs meant that the plan was abandoned and much smaller LCAs were needed to be used instead. Matt, short name. Compared to contemporary Soviet tanks, the M60 was exceptionally tall, thinly armored, and undergunned. Did American military planners simply make up for these deficiencies via doctrine? Because there didn't seem to be any particular rush in developing a replacement. Well, compared to contemporary NATO tanks, the T-72 was exceptionally cramped, unmaneuverable, poor at night fighting, and inaccurate, with limited ability to fight on rolling terrain because of lack of gun depression. These deficiencies also had to be addressed by doctrine. It all goes back to the point that I hammered on about earlier about what the individual designers thought was important. There was no rush in developing a replacement for the M6 because the tank was quite a capable one, especially once it was given thermal sights and depleted uranium ammunition. There was no M1, but it was perfectly serviceable and able to do the job. S-Face. I had mentioned that the Char B1 was created more of a pet project than one having any use in a tactic or doctrine. Were any other vehicles created as pet projects? If you, if you want to know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about uh, General SDN basically created the Char system back in the mid-1920s. Uh, the B1, what would become the B1, because he had this idea of what the tank could do, but not how it would be used. So it wasn't until much, much later, until the, the late 1930s, that he actually found where to put the Char B1 in the doctrinal organization. Which is just, I mean, it shows you, it's, uh, the, the development process for the tank was like 14 years. Well, half of Ferdinand Porsche's ideas might be in there, especially Mouse. Although, to be fair, the Porsche Tiger was at least supposed to try to meet an actual doctrinal requirement. Uh, you can also perhaps make a point to Panther as a vehicle which was designed partially by personal fiat by amateurs. 
The American equivalent would probably be the T23 medium, which again was actually to meet an actual requirement, but it was a tank which was Barnes' pet project, which he kept pushing for, no matter how unready the tank was for production, uh, down to the actually producing over 200 of the things, which of course ended up being of less use in the M6 heavies and never went anywhere. Then there were vehicles which were designed not as General's pet projects, which instead were designed as commercial enterprises in the hope that someone somewhere would find a use for it. Some of the Vickers tanks might be cases in point, or the Osorio. Uh, indeed, if I was to pull down a copy of Jane's armor and artillery, any of those ones I have up there on the shelf behind me from the 80s to now, you are going to find a ridiculous amount of entries which are vehicles available for sale, but not in active service anywhere. Minion, what can I tell you about the T6 device attached to Sherman's? Well, it's another way of getting a Sherman to float. Compared to DD tanks, it has some advantages and one disadvantage. The obvious disadvantage is that the things take up more deck space than DD tanks. However many regular tanks you can fit onto a landing craft, that's about how many regular DD tanks you can fit. Not so for tanks fitted with the swimming devices, because they're much, much longer. As you can imagine, these swimming devices are basically big pontoons, and the whole point of it, like a DD tank, is to provide displacement. You give anything enough displacement and it'll float, as long as there's no holes in it. The DD screen did this by providing displacement in depth. The swimming device did it by basically surface area. It was filled with foam, so if it were holed by enemy fire, the tank would not sink. It was not of a greater height than the hull top, which meant that the turret weapons could be fired as the tank came ashore. Accuracy was assisted by the use of the stabilizer, to the point that when the M18s were fitted with swimming devices, you could have a stabilizer fitted. Unfortunately, the tank would still run afoul of reefs, so the, the pontoon would hit the reef and the, the tracks would just go nowhere. The system would have worked fairly well in Europe without any reefs, uh, but simply dropping a tank with a deep wading kit generally seemed to do the job in the Pacific. Commissar Carl was watching the tank biathlon and the T-3485 demonstration. Lots of smoke coming off them from the exhaust. Is that typical? How much does smoke signature impact engine selection? Well, firstly, one has to give kudos to the Russians for running the course with T-34s. And if you get a chance, go find out on YouTube. It's great to see an old tank like that being run hard, reliving its glory days, as opposed to just driving in a circle at 10 miles an hour in a museum. It is also a little bit difficult to give a solid answer to your question, as it's hard to find good footage of a T-34 being run hard. Uh, but the impression that I'm getting is that, yes, they are smoking a little bit more than most. But still, it's a diesel, and diesels are simply not clean burning engines. Sorry, Volkswagen, and yes, I did own a TDI. Um, I mean, just go to a highway near a hill and watch the trucks and buses go by. Look at the amount of smoke that comes out. We used to joke a little bit about doing recon in the Bradley, with the diesel exhaust being a big exclamation point that folks could see from miles away, pointing to the observation position that the Bradley is driving into. And of course, Chieftain was famous for the big cloud of blue smoke, which followed it everywhere that it went. Smoke would have, I think, almost no bearing in the choice of engine type. That's down to power, weight, size, and the likes of that. Andrew Sebastian. If you have a vehicle with a turret and then add a, a, an RWS, a remote weapon station up top, you're getting pretty close to reviving the multi-turreted tanks of old. So, heavy IFV with a remotely operated heavy weapons turret, surrounded by multiple RWSs operated by the dismounts. Is that viable or useful? The only precedent I can think of for that is the remote weapon station on the back of early martyr IFVs, which you'll note were discarded with fairly quickly. There doesn't seem to have been very much else of such a nature. However, note the BMPT, which has three gunners, one for the turret and then one for each of the two grenade launchers on the front. So to that extent, at least, there is some validity. However, if the primary purpose of the heavy IFV is to transport of troops, then inherently, for the majority of the heavy combat, the fighting, one would expect that the troops would be out of the vehicle and doing troopy stuff, in which case they would not be in the vehicle to control the remote weapon systems. So it seems to me that there just isn't much purpose to it, especially considering the amount of expense involved. Adam Schindler, are tanks or AFVs easy to get stuck in muddy terrain compared to a civilian four-wheel drive vehicle? No, 
I mean, that's kind of the point of the things. That said, I have been highly impressed by the demonstrated mobility of the Humvee. Uh, the thing was damn good in mud. At least the M998, I'm not so sure about the heavier armored ones. Now that's not to say that tanks can't get stuck in mud. If it's deep enough, anything will get stuck, but it is harder to do. For tracks, oftentimes more solid ground like soil, sands and rocks become more troublesome and they're more likely to cause trouble over the sprocket or just cause the track to jump off the wheels. Josh Conti, why did I join the Irish Defence Forces? I was living in Ireland at the time, it seemed a logical option. I had a good friend who got in before I did and he seemed to be enjoying himself, he got me in. We, we stayed friends ever since he actually pinned my uh, lieutenant bars on me. What are the pros and cons of having had both US and Irish service? Well, the pros are when I joined the US military, I was already older than most. So I went through basic in Fort Knox at the age of 25. Not only was I more mature naturally, uh, but a lot of army isms were already familiar to me. It was also educational to learn other ways of doing things, both for perspective from my interactions with other nations when on deployment with the US, and just because occasional techniques or perspectives are not taught in the US and they were handy to know. And indeed, when we went to Iraq, the US Army had borrowed a training detachment of British soldiers to give us lessons in what they learned in Northern, uh, in Northern Ireland for their counterinsurgency operations, and most of which I already knew due to the similarity between British and Irish technique. Downside. It took me a while to stop raising my knee when doing drill movements. I kept failing my M240 gunnery skills test because in Ireland, the first thing you do when you go to a machine gun is you remove the source of ammunition. And that's the fourth step in the US. And also because I joined the US Army later, I am 45 years old and only just hit my 20 year mark. If for some reason I were to stick it out until mandatory retirement, I would have a smaller pension than if I joined up a few years earlier. USA, USA. Besides the Cullen's Cutter, did any other field modifications by common soldiers become standard issue modifications? I don't know if the Cullen's Cutter ever became officially standard issue, but certainly there are various reports in the field of things which achieved local sanction. For example, the use of German 75mm ammunition in the US M3 gun, the sliding gadget developed by somebody in 3rd Armored Division which was used to calibrate the gyrus stabilizer depending on the round in the tube, or even the applique armor of either steel plates, such as in 3rd Armory, or the racks for sandbag carriage you'll see on other armies. It seems that such tinkering became quite acceptable in the US military in World War II, arguably more so than it will be today. The definition of tinkering is also pretty broad. For example, when they welded new pintle mounts on the tops of tanks so that the caliber 50 could be fired from the front, uh, sorry, to the front from the hatch. Does that count as tinkering? TN Sheep. Vegetables which should be banned. They are what I term evil A vegetables. Artichoke and asparagus. They have no place on my plate. Now my first unit was down in Santa Cruz, for American unit, and it was just up the road from Watsonville, the artichoke capital of the world. They even have a huge artichoke monument downtown. I try to avoid the place. Kazuki K. Was water ingress ever an issue with riveted vehicles? And what is it with you and water ingress? No, I don't believe it was ever a massive issue. If nothing else, they'll drain easily enough through the rivets. Now remember, at the time that the vehicles were being riveted anyway, they didn't exactly have great expectations for what the tanks were going to do. And they were pleased enough that the thing went 200 miles in one go, let alone through water. Also, the Teledyne Expeditionary Tank suffered major reliability issues for the autoloader. Are those reliability issues still a factor in the MGS? And basically, if you look at the M1128 MGS, yeah, it is basically the same external turret as the Teledyne tank. But the answer to the question is no, because they changed the autoloader out. It originally used an autoloader manufactured by Ares. Now it's manufactured by Megat. I did have a quick hunt around, but I couldn't find any test reports on the Ares autoloader to know what was wrong with it. Entry level research. I recall you mentioning some TD crews use naval 3-inch star shells at Anzio, mating the naval projectile with their own casings. This is true, I did say that. For a 76mm Sherman, what other contemporary 3-inch ammunition could have been used that way? I found references to Russian SH-350 canister rounds. 
were there any three inch white phosphorus rounds that were used in the 76 or which existed and could be mated to a 76 case? So as it happened, I had a look up 76 millimeter white phosphorus back a while ago before they were filming Fury. And it turned out that no 76 millimeter white phosphorus rounds existed at the time and one would not be developed until about the Korean War for the M41 light tank. Similarly, I can find no reference anywhere to any attempts to cobble together a 76 millimeter canister round. Although I agree with you that tolerances would probably be less of a problem. I, I don't know why uh, there don't seem to be local fiddling with it either. You would have thought it would make sense. Fred Benton. No, I don't have any data on the 90mm guns T18 or T19 either. Apparently there were supposed to be higher velocity guns even than that on the Super Pershing, but I have not found any reporting from what I've uh, been able to look up so far. Garrett, was there any advantage to the short 7.5 over the long gun in the Stug? Other than not bashing into trees and walls and the likes. Uh, not really then. Uh, smaller rounds were easier to load and more of them could be carried, but in terms of the bang at the other end, the difference was negligible. And that is that. Hope you found the Q&A interesting and informative. I will see you on the next video. Take care.